Well, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter number one. <clears throat> it is the time of year that we remember the birth of our Savior. We've been talking about this mystery of godliness from 1 Timothy 3.16, how God came to the earth in the form of human flesh and was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, that he might give his life, as he said, a ransom for many. And so there's no, uh, there's no exhausting that story for me. I think we could probably show up to church week in and week out and just talk about what we call the Christmas story, uh, and it doesn't get old to me. It, it gets sweeter and sweeter the older I get, and the more I hear it, the more I study it, the more I teach it. Um, we just stand really in awe. And so we've been spending a couple of weeks just talking about all the different things that that means, that Jesus Christ came, God in the flesh, and the purpose that he had in his life and in his coming. Now, we don't know for uh, a fact when exactly that birth was, um, and it's interesting, if you start studying calendars much, you will find it doesn't take long to get confused, because humans have not done a good job of maintaining one calendar for very long, and so if you start trying to correlate dates and understand times and seasons and things that have happened through human history, you will inevitably find that as you start to try to compare and put together uh, all the different calendars, it gets, at least for me, in my simple mind, rather confusing. Uh, but we do know, I think, um, best we can figure, if you were to take probably the best information we have, you would find uh, that Zacharias, who was ministering in the temple, uh, was likely there. Uh, during the course of his duties under the family of Abijah, which we talked about here recently. Uh, and on the Jews' religious calendar, if you were to calculate when he was there doing his service, uh, and you figure that he went home after that and his wife conceived and that she was about six months ahead of Mary, we know from Scripture that that's true, you would find roughly that G the Jesus Christ roughly was conceived sometime around this time of year based on all of that math. Uh, but that's probably the best we can do. But the date's not really material, uh, but it is a good season, a good time of year to take some time to focus on this mystery of this person, Jesus Christ. I want you to find in Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 18, probably about exactly what you expected to be reading from this morning when you showed up uh, for services today. I want to talk a little bit about this name, Emmanuel and what that speaks to us uh, from Scripture and what we come to understand and know of Jesus Christ and being born to be uh, the Savior as we were just listening to Josh sing that song. He did a good job, didn't he? Uh, I wouldn't want to try that song. He did a fantastic job. Um, the Lamb of God, which comes to take away the sin of the world. If you'll stand with me, we'll read a few verses from Matthew chapter number 1. Begin reading in verse number 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Heavenly Father, we're thankful to you this morning for your word. We're thankful for the preservation of these truths that we can study and know, and we thank you for your spirit that is able to take them and apply them to our hearts in a way that uh, our human intellect certainly falls very far short of. We're thankful for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, for the redemption that you've given us through his blood, and for the fact that you loved us enough to make this all possible. We thank you for that gift for the promises that we have in Christ, and just pray that you might bless our time spent here this morning as we review these things that have happened some thousands of years ago and still being 
told to this day to give hope to men. Father, we thank you for that. I ask you to be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. You may be seated. We have uh, just a couple things in this passage I want to discuss and then kind of move on into the more of the central theme of what I want us to think about this morning. We have in verse number 23 being told, A virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So Emmanuel, we know, is the Hebrew name spoken by the prophet Isaiah some 700 years before this time. This was the long-awaited seed of the woman that had been spoken to Eve 4,000 years prior to this event happening. So all of a sudden, on God's, uh, on God's timetable and on his calendar, all these things that have been foreshadowed and foretold to men for thousands of years at this time are coming to pass. And it's a, it's a wonderful time to imagine what it was like for Mary and for Joseph And a lot of the people that were involved in this event, as the Lord was bringing all these things to pass in his own good time, I like the fact that we're given the interpretation here of the Hebrew. Of course, we have it translated once again into English, but it means God with us. So as we talk about that this morning, I really just want to contemplate what all does that mean for us? Because certainly from Scripture, we know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came, visited the earth in the person of Christ, was born to Mary, lived for approximately 33 years, gave his life on Calvary, was resurrected with power, and now has ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's waiting. He's waiting and expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, and we know that he is promised, just as he came the first time, by promise. We've been promised again that as in like manner as he left, which is in the clouds, that he will come again. So we find at least from this account, this much to be true. When we think of time and when God will fulfill the promises he has made, God thinks on a different scale. He doesn't think on the same scale that we think. But we live in the hope of him fulfilling his word and his promise. So when we talk about God with us, we've spent the past number of weeks talking about exactly who Christ was, and what the Word of God testifies to be true of Him. And I find that's necessarily important in our time today when there's so much error being taught about who He was. All kinds of different ideas that have come forth of the imaginations of men about Christ, who He was, and uh, all the things that we contemplate, we don't have to imagine. They're recorded for us in God's Word. We just read them and study them. We'll find them to be true. So we know that he was with us in the flesh. That's the entire point of this passage, that God came to be born of a virgin and that he was born and spent some time, as the author of Hebrews says, in the days of his flesh. And I want to look at just a couple of things with that. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter number 9. I'm detecting just a slight amount of sleepiness in the congregation this morning, so I'll keep you engaged by... Turning to a few scriptures, certainly I could just read them to you, but it'll help if you're practicing yourself. We could do sword drills if we need to, right? The only thing with that is all the kids would make the adults look bad because they practice that all the time. Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6 says, For unto us a child is born. Interesting that it says, unto us, a child is born. It's conveying the fact that God is giving a gift to his people. And the prophet Isaiah is saying here, unto us, a child is born. Not just unto Mary, and not just unto even the people alive in his time, but unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, if you're born again this morning and you have the Spirit of God 
uh, dwelling inside of you, then you have a, an inherent interest in the things of God's Word. And you'll find it fascinating, I'm sure, as I do, to find all the promises that God has given, and they all speak to the person of Jesus Christ. And here, even in this passage, we have this being foretold that there would be a child born and there would be a son given. Then it goes on to talk about some of the things that would be true about this child that was born. It said that he would sit upon the throne of his father, David. He would establish his kingdom. Now we know from prophecy, we've seen over and over again in scripture that oftentimes one verse can be divided by a great period of time. And we have the exact same thing here. It's kind of like when Christ sat in the synagogue teaching the people and he said, this day is this prophecy fulfilled in your ears. And you go back to where he's reading from and he kind of stops right in the middle of the sentence. Why? Because that was the part that had been fulfilled. So we talk about rightly dividing the word. There's still a great many promises that are true in Christ that we live in hope of, that we expect to see God fulfill in his own good time. We thank God on this behalf, though, that he is long-suffering. Could God fulfill his word at any time? Absolutely. There's nothing withholding him from wrapping up this whole thing and bringing in the, the kingdom of Christ and all the things that have been promised. Nothing stands in the way of that. But we know from the book of Peter, God's long-suffering with man. And so he's allowed a space of time for repentance and for the gospel to be preached. We have here this, what is being fulfilled when we get to Matthew, like I said, 700 years later, this very passage, and you'll find this phrase over and over again in the gospel of Matthew particularly. It says, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled. Matthew was of particular interest, uh, his audience primarily being the Hebrews, he was writing to them and showing them all the ways that Christ fulfilled the things that were spoken of him in the Old Testament. Right. And so he's talking to them and he uses this phrase, which you'll find often in his gospel, that it might be fulfilled that was spoken by the prophet saying, behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. The song that we sing, popular Christmas hymn, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. So Jesus was, in fact, uh, the child that was born. He is also, in fact, the Lord God Almighty, whose goings forth have been from everlasting. And so in the person of Jesus Christ, we have this mystery. He was a child born, a son given. He was also the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. If you want to just share just a couple things from Scripture, and it's, uh, I think it's interesting to do this. I like to go back through Scripture and just find all the different places where it talks about Christ in different ways. We find in Job 9.33 that he is the daysman that was looked for to judge between the two, between God and between man. He's the mediator of the new covenant from 1 Timothy 2.5. He's the advocate that we have with the Father in 1 John 2.1. He's the intercessor of Hebrews 7.25. He's the Son of God whose birth was announced to Mary by Gabriel in Luke 135. And it's interesting that he's announced to men as the Son of God at his birth. And then we go back to the book of Daniel, we see him appearing before the Father as the Son of Man. So he's the Son of God to men. He's the Son of Man in heaven. He's both God and man. It's a fascinating work that God has done in this person of Christ that we might have hope. That we might have an intercessor, someone who is tempted in all points like as we are, someone who could be our near kinsman redeemer, someone who could be our great high priest, someone who could be the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. It's this gift at Christmas that we talk about, that we think about, and we certainly get caught up in all the wrong things this time of year as well. It's easy to do that um, about the events and the holidays, and we stress out about uh, the things that we are doing to try to make it better for other people and we stress about whether or not they're going to like the gift that we got them, at least maybe when you're younger you do. I'm at the point in life where I figure if I get you a gift and you don't like it, you're the one that has the problem, yep. <laughs> not me. So I've kind of come full circle on that. Don't stress about it as much anymore. Uh, but really this time of year, uh, the best time you can spend is spent in the Word of God just, just marveling at the mystery of what God has done in the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, that he might be our savior. He is 
The Lord Jesus Christ, he's man, he is God, and he is declared to be overall God-blessed forever. So as we look at, I want you to turn over to John 7. As we look at this idea of God with us, we know certainly that this is true in the person of Christ and in the days of his flesh as he walked with his apostles in several uh, interesting stories in scripture that you can find. I think of the 10 that were cleansed, but only one uh, who gave God the glory. And it says that he returned and gave glory to God, falling down at the feet of Jesus Christ. So we find a lot of places in scripture where it's just interesting to study and to read and understand what it might have been like. And I think we're kind of uh, sometimes harsh on the people of that time who didn't believe. But the Bible says there was no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, when he appeared on the earth, uh, he looked as a man. Right? There, was, there wasn't a halo glowing around his head. It was the words that he spoke. It was the testimony of the Father from heaven. It was the works that he did. These things were the witness to who he was. But he made himself of no reputation. He did that deliberately. He made himself of no reputation. And so it's interesting when we imagine what it was like for him before he came. And I know you'll hear some people say that he kind of came to figure out who he was as he got older. I don't believe that. Uh, he didn't figure out that he was God as he got older. He was God in the flesh from the time of his conception. So I want you to imagine eternal God uh, forever in the presence with the Father and having the glory and the praise and the honor that he's due and worthy of as creator God, uh, that he left that place and came to be conceived and to go through the entire process of being in the womb for nine months, of being born onto this earth, living as a helpless child, really a great picture of us and how he committed himself into the hands of the Father. And that's exactly the life that we're called to live as well. We know that he had enemies from the day of his birth. Herod set about to try to kill him uh, and to see to it that this king of the Jews would never come to grow and be king of the Jews. So Herod sees him as a political enemy. You know, a lot of people today still see him as a political adversary. But Jesus Christ clearly taught his kingdom wasn't of this world. He wasn't interested in uh, taking Herod's kingdom and his dominion. He had been promised a dominion from the Father. So from the time of his birth, many adversaries, many enemies, but also true worshipers. We find that those uh, who had been taught, we expect most likely by Daniel. Daniel the prophet, who was over all of the magicians and astrologers in Babylon, if you read the account of Daniel, the king had placed him in that position. Daniel had a man, he was a man who was understanding and visions, and he had been given an exact timeline of when the Messiah was expected to appear. And all of a sudden, at the time of his birth, what do we have? But these magi from the east, who had likely been taught those same teachings of Daniel and had understood of the time of the appearing of the Christ child, they're showing up as well, and they bring gifts. It's interesting to me that those, uh, that those magi from Babylon would know and understand the time of the Savior's birth, but the very people to whom he was sent seem ignorant of it, seem ignorant of, of the fulfillment of the prophecy and the arrival of their Messiah, the one they claimed to be looking for, and they didn't know or discern the times or the time of their visitation. So they went on ignorantly. But we have these as a witness and a testimony that God's word was true, literally. If God's word wasn't literally true, they wouldn't have known when to be looking or to make the journey to come and to find him. And so it's interesting how all those things played out through his birth, the revealing. You'll notice that whenever the announcement was made, it was made to shepherds in the field. It wasn't made to the religious elite of the day. Uh, it wasn't heralded in any other way but the way that God saw fit and that he chose to do so. In John 7, verse number 33, Jesus Christ speaking here says, Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I, what? With you. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Jesus Christ had begun teaching his apostles that there was going to come a time when he wouldn't be 
with them. And what's he talking about? Because we know in Matthew 28 that he says, Lo, I am with you always. But yet throughout his earthly ministry, he's always saying, The poor ye have always with you, but me ye have not always. And here he's saying, There's just a little while that I am with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. If you turn over to John 12, verse number 8. Jesus says, For the poor always ye have with you. Right? We still have in our modern times the war on poverty. It's still going on. But he says what? But me ye have not always. Turn over to John 13. John 13, 33. Little children, yet a little while I am what? With you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go ye cannot come, so now I say to you. So he's telling them there's just going to be a little while that he was going to be with them, and that there was going to come a time that he would not. Over in John 14, he explains this in more detail. In verse number 16, he says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth, next word, with you, and shall be in you. So Jesus Christ was teaching his apostles of his departure. Emmanuel had come, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, and he spent the days of his flesh teaching them, instructing them, preparing them. And he was teaching them the whole time, I'm not going to be with you forever. I'm going to depart from you. So he's talking about his fleshly presence, that the person of Jesus Christ, that body that he had come in, was made to be sacrificed, and that he was going to fulfill the will of the Father to sacrifice himself, and that he would be resurrected, and then he would be ascended into the heavens, and he would be what? No longer with them after the flesh. And so we, get, we know from uh, Corinthians and Paul, he talks about uh, even though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth we know him no more. He's not here present in the flesh, but is he still with us? We said as you go through the Gospels, you'll find often that Christ speaks as a man at times, and at times he speaks as God. And he's at perfect liberty to do that because he is man and he is God. And so he would say uh, oftentimes things according to the flesh and be talking about things of men. He would talk to them as God as well. I want you to flip over to Matthew 28, and you'll see what he's saying as he correlates himself here in this way so that they would understand who he is. Matthew 28. In Matthew 28, verse number 19, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all na nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So in one sense, Jesus Christ is teaching them that he's leaving and going away. In another sense, he's telling them, I'm going to always be with you. I'm going to always be with you. You know, if it weren't for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, a lot of the things that we look for and hope for as it pertains to God with us, they're not possible. We know that man is sinful. We're alienated from God by our corruption, by our iniquity, by our wickedness, and none of us are exempt from that. We inherited it from Adam, and we are sinners by nature as well as by choice, that we do make decisions that are wrong. Right? Okay. I've got very many amens today, but I want to get a few amens when I say that we've all done things that are wrong. They're contrary to Lord God Almighty. Right? We have sinned and transgressed against Him. So Jesus Christ coming in the flesh, saying God with us, 
not only meaning his fleshly presence, although it does mean that, but it's more than that as well. Because he tells his apostle that this another comforter that would come, which is the Holy Spirit, that would come, would be with them and be in them. He said, even though I'm going to go away. And then he gets to Matthew 28 and he says, lo, I am with you always. So in this sense, is he speaking as man or is he speaking as God? He's clearly speaking as God because as God, he and the Father and the Spirit are one God. And so when he says, I'm going away, I'm not going to be here anymore. But then he tells them to comfort them. Lo, I'm with you always. He's speaking to them of the fact that he and his Father, the Holy Spirit is God, one God, that he will be with them, even though not in the, present in the flesh, that he will be present in them by his Holy Spirit. You'll see if you go through the New Testament in a couple of places. I want you to turn to Romans chapter number 8. You know, there's certain days when I get up to preach, um, when I feel like most of you are looking at me like you could do this better. And I just... <laughs> I know that's probably true, and it's the weakness and infirmity of my own flesh, uh, but today's one of those days, and it may just be I'm a little under the weather. Um, so just bear with me. I mean, we're, we're all doing the best we can, the best we know how. But I want you to see from Romans chapter number 8, uh, something that's of the utmost importance to those of us who have believed the truth of Christ. What does John say in the epistle of 1 John? That whoso hath not the Son doesn't have the Father, right? You can talk all you want about worshiping God, serving God, uh, going to heaven to be with God, but if you don't have the Son, Amen. you do not have the Father. Right. You, there is no other way around. There's no way to God except by the door, which is Jesus Christ. Right. So if you haven't accepted the Son, because the Father has ordained that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father, right? Him hath God declared to be both Lord and Christ. He's the Savior. So he's worthy. And if you want to circumvent that and find another way around to say, uh, I want to worship God and serve God, but I'm going to set aside the Son, then you've sinned and transgressed and you'll, you'll not have access to the Father. He is the door, right? He's the only way that we can have. And, the, and Romans 8 makes that crystal, crystal clear for us, but it also speaks to this idea of what it means that when Christ tells his apostles, lo, I am with you always." In Romans 8, in verse number 9, it says this, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. So right there, he's using the term what? The Spirit of God in you. And that lines up exactly with what the Lord said. He said, He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Right? He dwelled with them in the person of Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of truth would dwell in them when he was glorified. But you go later in the, I think it's the Gospel of Matthew, that says that the Spirit was not yet given because that the Son was not yet glorified. See, in the, in the purpose of God, in the mind of God, the Son was going to fulfill and complete his ministry and his work as sacrifice and as prophet, and he was going to be glorified and elevated to the position of Most High, and then he would send his Holy Spirit after that Jesus Christ was glorified. And so that's exactly what happens. And Paul speaking to that says, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, how does the Spirit of God come to be in anyone? It's by faith, by grace, through faith. So it's through faith that we believe the promise of God in Christ. We place our trust and our confidence in him. And then he gives the gift of the Holy Spirit after we have believed. So those who have the Spirit, they are of the Spirit and not of the flesh. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of what? Verse number 9. The Spirit of who? Christ. So what was the first term that he used in this verse? He says the Spirit of God. He turns right around and he uses interchangeably the term the Spirit of Christ. Why? Because it is... One in the self-same spirit. He said, he is none of his. And if what? And he goes a step further in verse number 10. And if what? Christ be in you. So now he's taken it, even brought it full circle. So we have the spirit of God, which is the spirit of Christ, which is Christ. And so if you have Christ in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life 
because of righteousness. So it's not only that Jesus Christ was Emmanuel and the fact that he was God in the flesh come to be with men in the flesh, but it's also that his spirit, the spirit of Christ, might dwell in our hearts by faith. So that we could continue to say through the generations, Lo, I am with you always. Even unto the end of the world, people will be able to say that who have the spirit of Christ. And Christ dwells in us, not in the flesh as Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, but by his spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, which is the spirit of Christ, which is the spirit of truth. It's all one and the self-same spirit. And so he is doing that work, and it is Christ in us. And this has continued to be taught in other places. Uh, if you turn over to 1 Peter chapter number 1. First Peter chapter number one, verse number 10. <laughs> verse number 10. I mean, I was up studying this, right? I mean, so I feel like asking you to just turn there in your Bibles and follow along is perfectly fine because most of the work's already been done for you. So I didn't say find in your Bibles the place where it says. I mean, it could have been worse for you. So we got First Peter 1. Verse number 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the what? Spirit of Christ, which was in them. In who? In the prophets. So what spirit was it that was working in the prophets from way back in old? Who, what spirit was it that was revealing to Daniel the things that Daniel wrote down that allowed the Magi to make that journey? What spirit was it that was prophesying through Daniel to make us aware that it's the Son of Man that is coming to the uh, Ancient of Days in the clouds of heaven and that he's going to be given a dominion and a kingdom that shall never be destroyed? It's the Son of Man. Who, what spirit was it prophesying of all those things? It was the Spirit of Christ. And so he goes on to share and understand that that Spirit of Christ is the same. And we find in Colossians 1, 25 through 28, I'll just read this to you. Wherefore, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, some of you may know it, Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And it's by this that Jesus Christ spoke in Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered together. There am I in the midst of them, right? He's speaking to them as God saying, when you gather in my name, there am I in the midst of them. When we gather together as an assembly in the name of Christ, uh, he's here with us. He's present with us as God. He's not here in the flesh, God with us, Emmanuel, but he is with us in his spirit. And he's certainly present in this room this morning. Uh, he's aiding me and helping me in my weakness of my flesh as I try to deliver this sermon to you to help you understand that it is by him that we have any hope at all. And it's because of what he's done, coming to be that little baby. And it's remarkable to think uh, that Mary, as she gave birth to this child, I mean, I remember when I held my first child, it, they feel very fragile, and you're kind of intimidated by the whole process because uh, you don't really know what you're doing. And so there's not a manual, and they just kind of push you out the door of the hospital, and they say, have fun. And you have no idea, like, shouldn't there be a, a book of some kind that tells me something? No, there's none of that. It's just instinct. You'll be fine, right? That's... <laughs> So here's Mary holding Jesus Christ. And you see these people coming to the temple when they come to have him uh, circumcised and they worship him as God. And it's fascinating. The greatness of the mystery by which God chose to redeem his people. That he came and he suffered right along with us. Suffered right along with us. Hungry, thirsty, tired, hot sweaty, cold, I mean, went through it all with us. 
He's certainly God with us. I mean, there's, there's probably no end to exhausting that thought and that phrase of in how many ways this is true. But it's not only that he was with us in the flesh while he walked the earth during his ministry, and it's not only that he's with us in spirit while we walk the days of our flesh. It's by his coming and through his gift that we can go from God with us in his fleshly walk to God with us by his Holy Spirit to us with God, which is what I'm looking forward to. I'm really uh, eagerly anticipating the day in which I'll lay down this old sinful flesh and that I will be clothed upon with my tabernacle, which is from heaven, and be perfected to serve and and walk in his presence. Uh, Can't even really imagine what that means exactly, but I know it's true. By God's word, I claim it, and I look forward to the day when I'll no longer be contending with the frailties of my flesh. But we see uh, that it's this hope that we have of us being with him that we look forward to. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6, I'll just share this with you. Uh, and then I want you to begin turning to John chapter number 14. In Hebrews 13, 5 through 6, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness. We learned about that in Sunday school this morning. Uh, a man named Achan who had a problem with covetousness, just like the rest of us. But our lifestyle shouldn't be typified by covetousness. It should be absent that. And we should be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Right? Paul's pulling that from Deuteronomy 31, and he's sharing it with us as a confidence that we can have for those of us who are in Christ, who though we may appear to be very poor, we are rich beyond measure in Christ and in the riches that are his. So that, he says, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Pulling that from Psalm 118. So we find in John 14, and I'll turn over there to be there with you, the Lord Jesus Christ giving really what has come to be uh, one of the most blessed hopes and promises that his people have had all down through the centuries. As those who have believed the word of God, received the testimony of Jesus Christ, and are looking for his fulfillment. And they're spending their days and their life and their years uh, living out a life that gives testimony to the truth of his words. It's just what we're called to do, to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. Your life, if you have believed the truth of these things, should exemplify the faith that you have claimed, that you believe that what God has spoken concerning his son is perfectly true, and that our hopes, our ambitions, our desires can all be wrapped up in him. And we find in John 14, verse number 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and what? Receive you unto myself. You know, there's a reason uh, that all down through time, God's people have been looking for Christ's return. You know, God's people were not commanded to watch for Uh, the arrival of the Antichrist. We're not commanded to watch for uh, the coming tribulation. We're not commanded to watch for the sun being darkened and the moon being darkened uh, and the the stars falling from the heavens. We're never told all those things. All through the New Testament, we're told to look for his glorious appearing. And he's promised when he appears that he's going to take us to be with him. That is completely distinct and separate from him coming back to earth to be here which we also see in Scripture is going to happen. You'll see in times in Scripture that Christ is going to come here and he's going to have gathered out of the earth all the things that offend and do iniquity. And then we see separately he's going to come here to catch away those who are his. This is what this is talking about. He's going to come to receive us to himself. Why? That where I am, there ye may be. See, he's already come to be where we are. And he spent the days of his flesh living where we are. And he was God with us where we are. And he went through all of the trials that he went through so that not that he could come visit us. He could have come visited us anytime. 
And he has all through creation. We know that he appeared uh, to Abraham, and he's appeared at different times in human history uh, on the earth to talk with his creation. But the perfect, uh, or the perfect reason, and the reason that it was necessary for him to come in the flesh and to die for us wasn't just to be with us here, it was to make it possible for us to be where he is. See, that was the, that was the, the bridge that couldn't be spanned any other way. There was this immeasurable gap, a great gulf that was fixed between man and God. It's not that he couldn't come visit us, but it's that we no longer had access to be where he is. And that's contrary to his purpose in creating us. And so he's done these wonderful things in Christ Jesus, not only that we might have God with us, but that we might have a hope of being with him as well. And that's the hope that we live under. That's the hope that we claim that's the hope that we expect is that we might have that hope also in second corinthians we'll finish with this i know it's a little bit of scripture hopping this morning uh, but we spent the past number of weeks covering a lot of the other things pretty well so this morning i want to kind of finish with this from second corinthians chapter number five Paul speaking to these very things because Paul was also encompassed with infirmity in the tabernacle of his flesh. Right? And he talked about the fact that we groan in that because we have a better hope and we have a desire to be delivered from that fleshly body. He says, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It's this hope that's necessary to deliver you from the feeling that you have to fight for the life you have now. People who really understand and get this and believe it, not know it, but believe it in the very depths of their soul have no, no compelling desire to fight and strive to retain this life. It's not there. There's no reason compelling. If I know I've committed myself to the Father, just as Christ did, as a perfect example, he didn't, he didn't strive, he didn't fight, he didn't contend to prolong his days. His days were promised to be prolonged beyond his death. That's the same promise we have. We don't have to fight and contend to prolong our days. We have a promise that God, who is able, will prolong our days if we are in Christ. That's the hope Paul's talking about. He says, for in this we groan. In other words, in this tabernacle, in this earthly house, you know what it's full of? Toil, labor, travail, groaning. It's all the things, and Jacob said, few have my days been and full of trouble. That's, that's kind of our lot in this life. And we're going to continue to experience that no matter how hard mankind seeks to deliver himself from it. It's going to continue to be the case. In this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Amen. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore... We are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Now, is it that he is not with us? No, it's that he is not in our presence in a, in a way that we can interact with him in the body. What Paul's looking forward to is a time when we will interact with our Lord Jesus Christ in the body. Amen. In order for that to be possible, our body must be perfected. And it will be perfected through death the same way that the Lord's body was glorified after he was resurrected on the other side of the grave. That's the same hope we have. As we've said, we can continually hope to be among that minutely small number who make it to the rapture and are changed in the twinkling of an eye. And it's good to hope for that and to maybe that'll be the case. But that's a very small percentage of those who are in faith in Christ. Most will go through the grave. And that's okay. We're not bothered by that. It doesn't, we don't feel deprived of anything in this life where God to this day and this moment require our lives 
at his hand when he's ready to do that. There's nothing uh, compelling me to argue against that. It's nothing but good for those who are in Christ. It's nothing but deliverance. It's nothing but salvation. It's nothing but perfection. It's nothing but being in his presence. And that's the hope that Paul had. He said, therefore, we're always confident knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. How do we know his spirit is with us? By faith. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body. Why? Because there, it comes along with something else. It's kind of the, if this is true, then this must be true, which is if we are in Christ and we are absent from our body, then we are in his presence. And that's the hope that we have, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. How is that possible? It's only possible because there was a child that was born unto us. Because there was a son given unto us. That we might have God with us. To give us a hope that having been redeemed by his blood and having put our faith in him and the promise he made towards us, that we might expect in the fullness of times that we might be with him. With him. Amen. And that's only possible in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why he said, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Amen. So this Christmas... It's not about rejoicing in what we have here, although it's good to use these things to put ourselves in remembrance. It's not about, uh, and don't stress yourselves out over making and creating just the right experience for your family and just the right experience for this and that. It's not about these things. It's about being mindful of the fact that because Christ came, we have a hope of something better than any of these things. And while we're here and we use them for his glory and his honor and his praise because he is worthy, he didn't die just so we could enjoy some things here. Right. He died that we might be delivered from this here. <laughs> That's what we're being saved from and delivered from. And he's prepared something better for us, that not only will he be with us, but we will be with him. Amen. Brother Adam, if you come, we'll have